welcome to lecture 1 D of the course and in this lecture we are talking about performance evaluation methods. So, we have already learned about different types of uh, architectures like the risk and CISC architecture, the instruction encoding and all. Now, here our focus is slightly different. Let us say if you have two architectures A and B and I just wanted to evaluate which is faster, which is having more throughput. So, I just wanted to evaluate two different computer systems and how do you evaluate two computer systems? In that case, I have to use certain metrics, some quantitative metrics. Sometimes I may be bothered about in both computer A and B, I will run the same program, I am looking at what is the execution time. In some other cases, I may be interested more in throughput. Sometimes the fairness may be used and sometimes I may be looking at how much starvation that happens and all. So, these metrics are really important, but then we have to understand what metric makes sense. For one category of computers, one metric may be useful, in some other category, the another metric may be useful. So, in this lecture, we would be introducing a different class of metrics and some laws and then we were trying to understand what are the basic parameters by which we can judge the computers. So, with this background, let us go into the details of today's lecture. When can we say that one computer is better than another one? It is a very common question that we face in our day to day life while working with computers. Let us try to understand this problem. The first one is desktop PC. When you consider the context of a desktop PC, then the execution time of a program is the best metric that can be used to assess its performance. So, given two desktop PCs, we have to run a program on the first PC, find out the execution time for completion of this and then run the same program on the second PC and then find out the execution time and the lower the one will tell you which is a faster desktop. But if you go to servers, rather than execution time, a metric known as transactions per unit time will be more relevant under the context of servers. Let us consider with the help of an example. You might have all done railway booking through the website of IRCTC or even with the mobile app of IRCTC. So, what happens from a customer perspective? When we wanted to make a railway booking, we go into the website or we go into the mobile app and then we give our request and this request will go into a central server wherein the booking information pertaining to various trains are available. Let us call this server as the IRCTC server. So, request for booking is reaching this particular server and the server has to accept this request, look into the data that is available. If so, either give the booking or give various options or putting in waiting list and then accept payment and confirm the tickets. These are the various sub process associated with booking of a ticket. We have to understand multiple such requests are going to come from various places into this particular server we are talking about. So, for machines like servers, it is not the execution time of a program because it is not the program which runs on that server only that matters. We are getting different requests from different machine and how fast we can provide the service. In this context, it is a transactions per unit time that a server can do it is also known as throughput. So, we have seen that for common desktop PC, when you run one particular program, it is execution time that is a more predominant performance metric, whereas in the case of servers, it will be the number of transactions that a server can complete in unit time that make more sense. When can we say that a machine X is n times faster than machine Y? So, the first parameter is something like execution time what we told. So, if x is faster than y, then the execution time on machine y will be more than the execution time on machine x and the ratio of them will tell you how much faster x is. So, execution time of y divided by execution time of x and that is going to give you n and then we can say that x is n times faster than y. But rather than execution time, if you wanted to look at a metrics called throughput, then we know that 
if throughput of x is more than throughput of y, then we can say x is faster. So, if throughput of x divided by throughput of y, if it is equal to n, then also we can say that x is n times faster than y. Looking further, we will try to understand a few more metrics that are being used. First is called the response time. So, when a request is coming from a machine to another machine, the time it takes for the second machine which is going to respond to the request is called the response time. Throughput is the number of tasks that is completed in unit time. CPU time is the total time associated with respect to a program in CPU execution. Generally programs have CPU burst wherein it is completely executed under the control of CPU or it can have a peripheral operation where no longer CPU directed intervention is required it will be a peripheral task that is being done. So, the fraction of time that is exclusively dedicated for CPU is called CPU time and then we have the wall clock time which tells that what is the overall execution time from the beginning of the program till the end of the program how much overall time it took and it is actually the sum total of CPU time and sum total of non CPU time which is the peripheral time and then other related operations and then speed up is yet another metric that is being used we have already seen that if the execution time of one is larger than other, we feel that we will get a speed up and speed up is yet another measure that is being used. Now, once we know this metrics and if you have two hardwares which are to be compared, how will you compare? What kind of program that we run? See, consider the case that you have two hardwares, let us call it as A and other one is B. When can we say that one is going to be faster than the other? When can we say that A is faster than B or there exists a speed up if you do the problem on A? You can simply say that let us say I am going to run a program called P and the program P is running in A and program P is running in B and if the execution time for running P on A, if it is smaller than running P on B, then we always say A is faster. A is faster as far as that particular program is concerned. Will it be a general case? Can we generalize always A is faster than B? Need not be. Consider the case of another program Q. Let us say if you run Q on A and B, this time it may not be the same kind of speed up that you get. It will be for B sometimes faster or A may not be showing the same kind of numbers. Let us run some one more program R, then also the execution time or the ratio of execution time in A and B may differ. So, how can we conclude how much faster is A over B? Because the kind of performance improvement that you get and the rate at which the execution time varies when you run on different architectures is specific to a particular program. When the program changes, execution time also changes. In this context, let us try to understand some kind of a standard programs, they are known as benchmarks. So, these benchmarks are actually standard programs which are being used. So, if we wanted to compare two architectures, we wanted to run this benchmark program. Benchmark programs are basically into three types. The first one is toy programs where your simple sorting program or searching program or a tree traversal program. These are all simple programs that we do on a computer as far as some basic exercises are concerned. You can always compare two architectures by running toy programs or we can use special category of programs which are known as benchmarks and specifically artificial benchmarks. They do not represent any specific task in real time, but a combination of instruction that can test all the hardware units of a computer. And the most commonly used one are called benchmark suits, something like the spec and the splash benchmarks. These are all commonly accepted huge programs which are generally used in the architecture community for assessing the performance of hardwares. The next slide will give you some input regarding what these benchmark suits are. So, consider this, this is called the spec 2006 benchmark suit. It consists of 12 integer applications and 17 floating point applications. And you can see some is a compression program, some are based on C compiler, some are fluid dynamics. 
some are linear programming optimizations, speech recognition programs. So, if you look at this in the spec website, we can see what are the different range of real life applications that are being used. So, generally if you want to compare the performance of two machine, it is always advisable to run these spec benchmark programs on machine 1 and the same benchmark program on machine 2 and find out what is the difference in execution time. The difference in execution time in one benchmark may not be the same when you run a different benchmark on these two machines. So, taking up a geometrical mean across all these will give you a normalized answer. Let us now try to understand what are the things that you are going to evaluate with the help of these benchmarks. There are certain metrics which are very important when you assess the hardware architecture. Programs called simulators are being generally used in the architecture community to assess the performance of hardware and it, these simulators will also help us to understand deeper about basic sub operations that are happening at the hardware level. One of the important metric that governs the performance of applications is IPC. When you run a particular program, how many instructions that you can complete in a cycle that is known as instructions per cycle or also abbreviated as IPC. So, when you run certain benchmarks, you could complete more instructions per cycle because of effective utilization of the available hardware. But for some other benchmarks, depending upon the inherent dependency and there may be some delay in running the subsequent instruction because you have to wait for the previous instruction to get over, IPC values may not be that high. Here, for various spec benchmarks given on the x axis, the y axis plot what is IPC value, instructions completed per clock cycle. You can see that different benchmarks, the IPC value sometimes it is very low and sometimes it can be very high as well. Yet another metric that we will use is known as the instruction profiling. So, these are all spec 2006 benchmarks. With the help of simulators, we are trying to understand what is the split up of various category of instructions. In this case, we have considered that there are load and store instructions and there are branch instructions and then the rest of the instructions are grouped together. So, this bars will show what is the appropriate fraction of load instruction in the entire instruction suite store instruction, branch and other category of instructions. That is basically used to find out the split up of the instructions. Why this split up is important? Sometimes think of a case that this yellow portion is branches. There are certain benchmarks which have very few branches and there are certain benchmarks which have very high rate of branches as well. So, if we are trying to improve upon how branching is being done, we will learn it later in this course. There is a technique called branch prediction which will help us to predict whether a branch will be taken or not. So, if you are using an advanced branch predictor, then we will get better performance whenever there is a branch instruction. That is performance is limited to how many number of branch instructions are there in a given instruction suite. So, here we have seen that there are certain benchmarks which consists of heavy number of branches and certain benchmarks which are having limited number of branches. So, when we use an advanced branch predictor, these benchmarks which have a rich mix of branch instruction will obviously get the benefit. Think of a case that we are going to have a sophisticated branch predictor circuit in your hardware and the program that you run is not having enough number of branches, then the performance gain that we get is very, very minimal. So, Trying to understand what is the split up of instruction will also give the designer a greater picture about any kind of optimization than that is done on a hardware, will it be impactful or not. Coming forward, let us try to understand yet another metric that is known as the number of data cache misses per 1000 instruction. So, MPKI misses per kilo instruction is a metric that is commonly used when you run 1000 instruction, kilo instruction, how many misses are there in the cache. We all know that when you fetch an instruction, the fetching happens from the cache 
and when you have a data access like load or a store operation, again we are going to access the data cache. So, the graph that we are going to discuss now, it shows the data cache misses per 1000 instruction. When you run 1000 instruction, how many of that resulted in a miss in the data cache? You can see that an application called MCF, the data cache miss is very high. It got roughly 156 data cache misses when it was accessing 1000 instruction. And there are certain other applications also which got around 50 data cache misses. But some of the applications like GOB, MK, HMM, ER, these are all less than 10 data cache misses and that is going to be a very important significant number that will help us to understand what is the memory profiling as far as these benchmarks are concerned. So, when we use a good caching mechanism, good replacement algorithm, then those benchmarks which suffered heavy cache misses will be able to reduce their cache misses. If an application is already having very low cache misses, let us say less than 10 cache misses for every 1000 instruction, then the kind of improvement that we get by optimizing the cache may not be much because already we are having very few cache misses. So, the scope for further improvement is less. So, these kind of observations that are being taken from the real benchmark suit running on the simulators will give the designer a bigger picture about what are the scope for improvement or to what rate I can optimize a given system. Moving further, let us try to understand one more metric. It is known as branch miss predictions per 1000 instruction. You can see that there is a lot of benchmarks where branch miss predictions are less. I already mentioned we have branch predictor circuits and these branch predictor circuits will help us in predicting whether a branch will be taken or not before the actual execution of a branch. So, the prediction is correct, then the next instruction fetched will be the correct one either from the follow through or from the target as predicted by the branch predictor. But we can see that there are certain benchmarks where the predictors are not giving good output, they are having many number of miss predictions. This will also help us whether a branch predictor is going to help a particular program or not. We will now try to understand a parameter known as spec ratio. Spec ratio of a machine A is defined as the execution time of a program on a reference machine divided by execution time of A. So, consider the case that I have a laptop. I wanted to know what is the spec ratio of my laptop or with respect to the specific processor that is running on the laptop, I wanted to know what is the spec ratio. So, first we will take a program, we run the program on a reference machine. So, the reference machine for spec 2006 is defined as Sun Ultra Enterprise 2 workstation with 296 megahertz ultra spark 2 processor. So, run a program on this reference machine and run the same program on your machine A. In this case, the processor that we are considering inside the laptop and that is going to give you spec ratio. If the spec ratio is larger than 1 means your machine will take less time in running the program. We can always find out the ratio of spec ratios. Let us say I wanted to know what is the spec ratio of A over spec ratio of B. So, in that case execution time on the reference machine divided by execution time of A, the whole divided by execution time of the reference machine by execution time of B. Since execution time on the reference is common, we will get execution time of B by A or performance of A by A that is known as spec ratio of A divided by spec ratio of B. Now, when you have different benchmarks, let us say A 1 is a spec ratio for one of the benchmark, A 2 for other, A 3 for other like that up to A n. Then by taking a geometric mean of this will give you the average spec ratio. So, the individual spec ratios you take the geometric mean of that, that is the spec ratio associated with that particular hardware. The next concept we are going to learn today is about Amdahl's law. We have seen so far that if you wanted to improve the performance of a machine by focusing on certain specific hardware, how much returns we are going to get? Amdahl's law clearly specifies the amount of returns that we are going to get if you make some modification on any part of the hardware. Amdahl's law defines 
the speed up that can be gained by improving some portion of the computer. The performance improvement to be gained from using some faster mode of execution is limited by the fraction of time the faster mode can be used. So, let us say I am going to improve one hardware unit by making some modification on it. The new execution time is defined as the old execution time into 1 minus the fraction where the enhancement is done. What is the overall fraction of enhancement plus fraction enhanced by speed up enhanced or if you find out what is going to be the speed up, speed up is defined as execution time of old divided by execution time of new. It is 1 by 1 minus fraction enhanced plus fraction enhanced by speed up enhanced. So, think of a case that, so think of a case that if we have 10 percent of the instructions that are getting benefited by an advanced hardware and the speed up that you are gaining is going to be 5 times. That means, in the speed up it is 1 divided by 1 minus 0 0.1 that is a portion which is not affected by these instructions and this 10 percent of instructions are getting a speed up of 5. So, that is how it is being done. Now, think of the case that if rather than 10 percent it is 100 percent of instructions are going to get benefit then this will become 1 minus fraction enhanced will become 1 minus 1 it is 100 percent. So, this will become essentially 0 plus fraction enhanced by speed up enhanced that is going to be 10 by whatever. So, this will become 1 divided by 5 let us say 5 times is the speed up that you get. So, then overall speed up will be 5. What if none of the instructions are going to be benefited then this will this portion will become 0 and this portion will be 1 itself. So, that you will get the same answer. So, depending upon what is a fraction enhanced we are going to find out what is the overall speed up that you get. So, Amdahl's law gives the general overview that the amount of speed up that you can get is restricted to the fraction enhanced it is very important it is restricted to the fraction enhanced. We will now take a simple illustration example to understand Amdahl's law. Suppose that we wanted to enhance the floating point operations of a processor by introducing a new advanced floating point unit. Let the new floating point unit is 10 times faster for floating point computations than the original processor. Assume a program has 40 percent floating point operation, what is overall speed up you are going to gain? So, for all floating point operations we get 10 percent speed up, but floating point operations are only 40 percent. So, what is overall speed up that you are going to get? So, the speed up overall is 1 by 1 minus fraction enhanced plus fraction enhanced by speed up enhanced. So, the fraction enhanced is going to be 0 0.4 and the speed up enhanced is 10. So, when you substitute it in the equation you get 1.56 times. So, even though floating point operations get 10 times benefit or they are being speeded up by 10 times since they are limited to only 40 percent of the instructions you would the overall speed up that you get is 1.56 only. Amdahl's law for parallel processing. Consider the case that you have 500 steps of operation to be done and it is taking 500 unit of time. So, each step is going to take 1 unit of time. Wherever there is this blue color, these are the section inside the task which can be done only by one unit. Whereas, wherever you see this white color, these are portions in the task which can be parallelized by having more parallel units. Let us now consider that you have two parallel units. So, this 100 since it can be done only by one unit, whereas this 100 can be done by two units parallelly. So, it may take only 50 units of time, even though 100 units of work will be completed in 50 units of time because we are having two units to parallelly do the work. And after that again there is a sequential portion where only one unit can do the job and again you have a portion where there exists parallelism so 250 and then you have one more 100. So, the total work 
is 500 units of work is completed in 400 units of time and the speed up you are going to get is 1.25x. Consider the case that rather than 2 units doing the job, now I have 4 units doing the job. So, the entire 100 unit of work which can be parallelized can be now completed in 25 units of time. So, if you proceed like this, the same 500 unit of work will be over in 350 units of time. So, the speed up is 1.4 times. Let us assume we have infinite number of processors can help. Even though you have infinite amount of processors, these 300s will be still there. Whereas, the one that is been paralyzed, we assume that it will take 0 time approximately because we have infinite number of processors. So, the total work is now 500 and the time is going to be 300. So, the speed up that you get is 1.7x. So, we have used infinite number of processors, but even then the speed up you are getting is only 1.7x times. So, this is the graph which will show how much performance or speed up that you can get based upon the fraction of instructions where the modification is impacted. So, speed up is defined as 1 by 1 minus alpha plus alpha by n where alpha is the fraction. If alpha is 50 percent that means 50 percent of the code is parallelizable. This graph shows this is the blue line which is almost parallel to x axis. On the x axis we are plotting the number of processors ranging from one processor to over 65,000 processors and the y axis it is plotting the speed up. You can see that the blue line the speed up increases as the number of process increases, but beyond the point even if you increase the number of processors you are not going to get any benefit. Similarly, if you look at 75 percent where parallelism is applicable that is a red line. So, when compared to the blue line the red line has more speed up, but there also we can see beyond the number of processors even if you increase the number of processors you are not going to get much benefit in terms of speed up. Whereas, the green represent 90 percent of the code is parallelizable. Again the speed up is more and it is getting to higher numbers again beyond a point then we are not going to get any benefit in speed up. Similarly, for 95 percent also we can see that the speed up is high, but beyond a point we cannot do much. So, this restrict us even with 95 percent of code that is parallelizable anything more than 256 processors is not going to give us much rewards. So, this gives a deeper intuition about the performance that we can gain from Amdahl's law. Now, consider another design example. A common transformation required in graphics processors is square root. Implementation of floating point square root vary significantly in performance, especially among processors designed for graphics. Suppose floating point square root operation is responsible for 20 percent of the execution time of a critical graphics benchmark. One proposal is to enhance floating point square root hardware and speed up floating point square root operation by a factor of 10. The other alternative is just to try to make all floating point instruction in the graphics processor run faster by a factor of 1.6. Floating point operations are generally responsible for half of the execution time of an application. Compare these two designs using Amdahl's law. So, we have two modifications that is been suggested. One is proposing a new floating point square root hardware which will speed up floating point square root operations only by a factor of 10. The other option is all floating point instruction not only the floating point square root any floating point instruction we are going to get a speed up of 1.6 that is by making the graphics processor work faster. Let us now try to find a solution the case A is by proposing a floating point square root hardware optimization whereas case B is floating point instruction optimization. When you apply this in the equation you can see that only 20 percent of instructions are floating point square root operation. So, if you put that 20 percent here and these are going to get 10 times speed up the overall speed up that you get is 1.219 times. Whereas, in case B we know that 50 percent of instructions are floating point operations and these 50 percent will get a speed up of only 1.6. So, overall you get 1.23 times which is 
faster than case A. So, this shows that even though I as a designer has two options, either go for an, an advanced floating point square root hardware or go for a better graphics processor which will improve all the floating point operation. Even though the speed of that you get is limited to 1.6 times, overall that is going to get benefit because it is going to impact 50 percent of instructions whereas the hardware optimization on floating point square root is going to impact only 20 percent of the instructions. So, with this we are able to see that Amdahl's law is going to help us to compare two designs. Moving further into principles of computer design, we know that every processor is being triggered or run with the help of a clock and it is a clock rate that is considered as the basic step by which you can do an operation inside the processor. Generally, this clock is represented in terms of gigahertz or one clock period will come up to nanoseconds. Now, CPU time that is execution time of a program is defined as number of cycles needed to complete the task into clock cycle time. So, CPI that is clock cycles per instruction is defined as CPU clock cycles for a program divided by the instruction count. So, the total CPU time that it will take for a completion of program is depending on number of instruction that is instruction count into cycles required per instruction into how much is one cycle that is clock cycle time. Instruction count will tell number of instructions per program, CPI will tell clock cycles per instruction and CCT will tell number of seconds per needed for a clock cycle. So, when you look at clock cycle time that is a hardware technology, what is a crystal oscillator that you are using? CPI is being governed by the organization of the hardware and the instruction set architecture that you use. So, if the instruction set architecture follows a risk one, CPI will be less. If it is a CISC one, then the CPI is going to be slightly larger. And the instruction count depends on compiler technology as well as the instruction set architecture. So, when you consider about how much time it is needed to complete a task, that is the CPU time associated with a task is being governed by what hardware technology that you use, the internal organization of the processor, the instruction set architecture that you use and the kind of compiler that is going to translate these programs into machine language. But different instructions have different CPIs. So, the clock cycles needed to complete a task in CPU is computed by summation of instruction count into the CPI. So, if you have an add operation, find out the total number of instruction which perform add multiplied by what is the average number of cycles needed to perform add. So, CPI of add operation into the instruction count of add operation that is first component. Similarly, you do the CPI for the next instruction let us say subtraction operation into the instruction count for the subtraction operation like that you do a summation across all the instruction and the CPU time is defined as whatever is the average number of clock cycles needed to carry out the task into the clock cycle time. So, we have one more example which will help you to compare two designs which are varying in CPI and clock. Consider two programs A and B that solves a given problem. So, A and B are two different programs, both are solving the same thing. Probably we can consider A as one kind of a sorting, let us say quick sort and B is bubble sort. A is scheduled to run on processor P1 which is operating at 1 gigahertz and B is scheduled to run on processor P2 running at 1.4 gigahertz. Program A has 10,000 instruction out of which 20 percent are branch, 40 percent are load store and the rest are ALU instruction. B is composed of 25 percent branch. The number of load store instruction in B is twice the count of ALU instruction. So, this statement number of load store instruction in B is twice the count of ALU means ALU will be 25 percent and load and store will be 50 percent. So, the twice has been maintained. Total instruction count of B is 12,000. In both P1 and P2 branch instructions have an average CPU of 5 
and ALU instructions has an average CPI of 1.5. Both architectures differ. In the CPI of load store instruction, they are 2 and 3 for P1 and P2 respectively. Now, the question is which mapping whether A running on P1 or B running on P2 solves the problem faster and by how much. Let us now try to understand what the given problem is. You have a problem to solve. There are two approaches by which we can solve. The first is called program A, second is program B. Now, the program A is supposed to run on a machine P1 which operates at 1 gigahertz and program B is supposed to run on P2 which is operating at 1.4 gigahertz. A consists of 10,000 instruction, B consists of 12,000 instruction. The percentage split of branch instructions, load store instruction and ALU instruction is given. Similarly, percentage split of the other three is given for program B as well. Now, given this context, which approach is going to solve our problem, whether A on P1 or B on P2? Let us try to summarize what are the details that is been given. A is running on P1, B is running on P2, the appropriate clock speed is been given, the instruction count is 10,000 and 12,000. It is a fraction of branch instruction versus load store versus ALU, 20 percent branch, 40 percent load store and 40 percent ALU. Similarly, it is given for B on P2 and the CPI value is also given accordingly. We know that they differ in CPI only for load store instruction. It is 2 for the first machine and 3 for the second machine. Now, we have to compute what is the CPI of program A on machine P1. So, you divide the fraction with respect to CPI. So, you know that you have a CPI of 5 for branch instruction and there are 20 percent branches. Since there are 20 percent branches and each branch will take 5 cycles, it is 0 0.2 into 5. You have 40 percent load store instruction which have a CPI of 2 and you have 40 percent ALU instruction which has a CPI of 1.5. So, the average CPI is 2.4. Once you get the CPI, then to find out what is execution time, CPI into instruction count into what is clock cycle time. So, you get 24,000 nanosecond. Repeating the same thing for B on P2, we have 25 percent of them are branch instruction which will take 5 cycles, 50 percent of them are load store instruction which will take 3 cycles, remaining 25 percent of them are ALU instruction which will take 1.5 cycles giving a CPI of 3.125. To compute execution time, it is CPI into instruction count that is 12,000 into one clock cycle is only 0 0.714 because we are using a 1.4 gigahertz clock. So, that gives the execution time of 26,775. The program A while running on P1, it will take 24,000 nanosecond. Whereas program B while running on P2 will take only will take 26,775 nanosecond. This is the comparison. This shows that A on P1 is giving you better performance because it takes lesser execution time. Hence A on P1 is faster. We will now try to work out one more problem on Amdahl's law which gives a fair comparison on how various optimizations are done parallel and what is the impact on them. A company is releasing two latest version beta and gamma of its basic processor architecture named alpha. Beta and gamma are designed by making modifications on three major components A, X, Y and Z. It was observed that for program A the fraction of total execution time on these three components A, X, Y and Z are 40, 30 and 20 percent respectively. Beta speeds up x and z by 2 times but slows down y by 1.3 times whereas gamma speeds up x, y and z by 1.2, 1.3 and 1.4 times respectively. So, how much faster is gamma over alpha and whether beta or gamma is faster for running a find the speed up factor. Since there are three component component x, y and z that are going to be impacted by some order and it is different for beta and gamma. Speed up 
with Amdahl's law can be represented with this equation that is given 1 divided by 1 minus fx minus fy minus fz plus fx by nx plus fy by ny plus fz by nz. The fraction fx, fy and fz is same because it is a property of program A. If you implement that on beta, the speed up that you get nx is 2, ny is 1 divided by 1.3 because it is actually slowing down the factor y by a fraction 1.3. So, the speed up is 1 divided by 1.3 and nz is equal to 2. Whereas, for gamma nx is 1.2, ny is 1.3 and nz is 1.4. Now, you substitute these values of fx, fy, fz, nx, ny and nz in the equation. That is the speed up of beta over alpha is going to be 1.267 times. Whereas, the speed up of gamma over alpha is 1.239 times. So, gamma is having 1.239 times that is the first question that is asked. It is 1.239 times faster over alpha. Whereas, beta is faster than gamma because beta's value is higher than that of gamma. So, beta is faster than gamma by 1.022 times. So, we come to the end of today's lecture. Let us try to have a quick recap of what we studied today. We started our discussion with why we need to have performance evaluation methods. When you have two designs, then if you wanted to find out which of the design is superior than the other one, we need to have certain metrics. We familiarized with execution time, with the throughput, with response time with speed up, these are all the various metrics that we learned today. And then we try to find out what is the scope in Amdahl's law. It defines how much speed up that you can get by making some optimization in one component of hardware. We worked out a few numerical problems in execution time of a program on a hardware, which is dependent on the instruction count with the CPI and the clock cycle time. And then we have few more illustrations on the application of Amdahl's law. So, that concludes today. There are many other numerical questions similar to this that is given in the textbooks that is being prescribed as part of the course. I request you to familiarize as many number of numerical problems so that you will get a deeper understanding about the problems that we are discussing. Kindly post your queries if it is. Thank you.